Um, Marian is a senior policy advisor at DANCE, and she is really the right person you can ask your question to if you have doubts about fair data and repositories for data. Um, Marian, thanks for uh, your time today. I'm now making you presenter in case you want to share your screen. Yes, thank you, Ilaria. I do like to share my screen, so let's see what happens. Uh, it was working. I saw your presentation for like a second. Yeah, and it says that Katharina Barbosa is now presenter. Uh, okay, no, that shouldn't be the case. So I'm making you presenter again. Okay. Okay. Okay, again. Okay, cool. I see now that Lucia would like to share a screen. So no, no, um, <laughs> just go on with yours. <laughs> okay. Our presenter today. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That was indeed my intention to <laughs> present uh, a very brief bit about what is already in the movie for those who haven't seen it. But first, uh, thank you, Ilaria, for the introduction. <clears throat> and um, welcome to all who are here um, in this session on fair data in trustworthy repositories. So let me ask you, um, by way of introduction, um, we are very a rather small group, so maybe you can add some input in the chat box. Um, can you please indicate if you ever used FAIR data or if you plan to use FAIR data? Yeah, please don't be shy and <laughs> participate. No problem if you say no. So you can use the chat box for this. Okay, there's one yay. It's crystal will. Okay, making data fair, yeah. In your publications. Okay, that's also a nice one. Maybe we get back to that one. Um, and indeed, not everyone is in a position to use data. If you're not an active researcher at the moment, maybe there's not a reason for you to do so. Um, who of you uses um, serious, trustworthy digital repositories? Very quiet in the chat box. Yeah, silence. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I hope that someone of the participants uh, had a look at your uh, at the, the recordings of the of your movie. Uh, but I think that I hope so too. <laughs> maybe it's good if I just recap uh, a little bit from what I think is important. Okay. No, they're being used. Open air compliant repositories are being used. Yeah, certified repository use. Okay, that is all very relevant. Um, let me do a, talk you through a few of the slides now. But I'm, I'll make sure it won't be a full presentation. So stop me if I'm it's tedious. Um, so one thing I really would like to uh, address is this slide. And I'll make a bit of space. So last summer, um, we saw the uh, recommendations from the high-level expert group on fair data. And you probably saw them too. And uh, among the recommendations, there are two that are specifically addressing repositories. Um, recommendation 10 says that repositories should be encouraged to achieve the core trust seal certification. Um, and uh, recommendation 29 says that repositories should publish assessments of the fairness of data sets. Um, now, I work at DANS in the Netherlands, and one of the services we provide is a long-term digital repository. So, of course, I'm biased when I read these recommendations. I like them very much. 
Um, and I like especially the notion that repositories should not just stimulate that everyone delivers fair data to the repository, but also that the data sets that are already in our holdings uh, are as far as possible and that anyone can also measure the level of fairness. So if you like, I can tell a bit more about that. Um, another slide I want to show you again is this one with images and information from the European Commission um, in their guidelines on fair data management in the Horizon 2020 program, they um, mention that they prefer that you deposit data, documentation, metadata, code in certified repositories. And of course, ideally, repositories which support open access when possible. So they already connect the notion of fair data and repositories. And actually, I think um, it should be like um, speaking about stakeholders or shareholders in data management, there is um, the research data life cycle and in several stages of the life cycle, it's good to think about making data fair and particularly in the preservation and in the sharing stages, repositories can help you to um, distribute and provide access to fair data. So basically that is my hope and my ambition um, in this area. So, I think that should be it for now to recap the movie. Um, maybe, Ilaria, you can share the questions that have been posed ahead of the session. Yeah, so just let me share my screen. Um, so, there were a few uh, questions on Mentimeter. Uh, to, well, survey um, research data usage and practices. So uh, the first is, the first question is, have you ever made use of data of other people? And, well, the average answer is, answer is sometimes, but we only have three respondents, unfortunately. Um, then you see um, that the opinion from the public is that getting good quality data into a repository is the responsibility of the researchers who created the data. And I'm curious about this one. Is this uh, the usual best practice or are there usual, usually um, librarians or data support staff that are really helping researchers? Um, I think it's different. So there are at least uh, a good number of domain-specific repositories that are very explicit in guiding um, and even training research and research communities in what good, good quality data means in their field. Um, and then it is typically the responsibility of the researcher or the research team or maybe the data management working uh, in the uh, institute to make sure that the data, the data set meets those criteria. For instance, when it comes to um, the correct amount of documentation or when it comes to making sure that um, sensitive data um, is properly guarded or probably uh, anonymized, whatever fits best. So uh, it is give and take. Um, the researcher is responsible in general, but repositories sometimes provide a lot of inform information and support to help them. At the other hand, you have very broad and generic repositories, as a node was mentioned in the chat box. They typically don't have the staff to deal with that kind of work. So then it's really left to the researchers and the scientists. Um, and then there is sometimes not even a real check on the quality of the data. So it, it differs widely. Uh, the main repositories are usually quite good and take a part of the responsibility. But even then, they assume that the response that, uh, that the uh, researchers and the research community itself, the people who generate, collect the data, are best placed to do that. Thank you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice answer. 
Um, we have other two questions in the chat box. Uh, the first is from Joy, uh, who is asking, is it feasible for assessment of fair data to be carried out by repositories, quite time consuming and might depend on the real users? Um, yeah, that's, <laughs> it is um, quite time consuming and uh, in general. Um, could I have, um, could I share my screen once again? Because I have uh, some... Yes, just let me uh, enable you as a presenter again. Okay. I've prepared a few slides on this, just um, to okay. explain what it might mean to... Um, so, and I'll move this one away. Um, so when it comes to assessing the fairness of data um, in a repository, typically, um, the question is basically, okay, what is fairness? Um, is it, does the data fit my purpose? For me, if I have a specific research question, fairness might be something different than um, for someone who wants to use data in education, for instance, or who wants to use data as a journalist. So fairness is a kind of fit for use. And of course, this is not the same um, definition of fairness as you find in the, uh, the bullet list, you probably all know, or in the underlying article that was uh, published uh, a year and a half ago. So fair is still a, a shifting notion in a way, but at least can we trust data and who should do the assessment are important questions. And then there are a couple of um, initiatives um, to come up with measurements for fairness. One is by the Go Fair Metrics group. Um, I realized that the image on screen is too small to really read, but the notion they are working from is that um, Different entities play a role in measuring fairness. So not only making it, but also measuring. Um, communities would play a role in the metrics that are relevant to their domain. Um, it may concern, for instance, typical file formats or typical uh, flavors of metadata. Um, but there can also be more automated parts of the measurement. Um, some elements of the, of the, the figure principles uh, can be measured um, by tools and they would not need human beings. And that is an approach that is being um, tested or explored at DANS. Um, again, I'm biased. Um, this is the model that we are developing into a prototype at the moment. Is it possible to really find the uh, items that you know from the bulleted list of fair aspects in a kind of star system, as we all know from Amazon, Ball.com and whatever. Um, so, sorry, assuming for instance that if metadata doesn't even have a persistent identifier, it shouldn't deserve more than just one star. Um, but if it would have a persistent identifier but very limited metadata, perhaps two stars and so on. And this would build to a kind of scoring system with weights. You could do this for a cup for all of the elements of fair. And the results might then be visualized like this, for instance, um, as a kind of batch with a level of fairness. What we noticed in this experiment so far is, um, of course, we tried to make the 15 underlying fair principles um, very black and white because if you want to have them measured or assessed automatically they can only be black and white. I mean machines often very deal badly with uh, subjectivity and then we found that it's relatively easy to define um, findability, accessibility and interoperability levels but not so much reusability levels. So we came up with the idea that reusability is more the results of the other three. Um, like I said, it is a prototype. We're working on a new version, of, so you can go have a look at the first prototype, but be aware that it's under uh, development. Um, but we also asked the question of who should be the assessor, the, the question that Joy asks. And during the period we ran the first experiment, the first prototype, we thought, okay, maybe it can be data users, 
um, but we found that uh, the prototype was still perceived as quite heavy. It is still a lot of work to measure on all these 15 items a data set. So then the idea came that it might be an archivist or the data manager at the repository. Um, what we're doing now is redesigning this checklist for researchers, basically for at least two stages during the, the process. At a very early stage, when they are uh, generating or uh, data, or are, when they are looking in a repository to find relevant data to work on and to reuse, but also for the later stage when they are preparing the data for depositing them in an archive or a repository. So we hope that this kind of measuring tool can play a role and like I said we are still not sure who should do the assessment and if it is feasible for repositories to do so. Thanks Marian. Uh, there's another comment from Joy uh, on these and then there's a question from Dart. Um, yeah, so uh, basically Joy's comment is about um, if there's something, some, a link that can be shared about uh, yeah, fair assessment and I think you already put it in the chat. Yeah. Not in the chat, sorry, in your slide. Okay, and then there's this question from Gareth. Um, the process to gain the core trust seal certification involves the submission of a set of self audited set of answers to a number of questions, establishing if the repository meets particular requirements. While many of these requirements are aligned to FAIR, the principles themselves are not explicitly mentioned as part of the certification process. Is this likely to happen in the future? Oh, that's also a nice question. Um... The principles are indeed very much aligned to FAIR um, and let me show them for those who may be not familiar with them. Um, so this is still, yeah, you can still see the screen, I think. Yes, yes, yes it works fine. Okay, good. Um, so what you see here uh, is a, the majority of the requirements uh, in the core trust seal certification scheme and all the blue words um, relate to making data fair or assessing the fairness of data. Now the requirements are written basically for repositories that want to um, acquire the certification or that have acquired a certification. There are, I think there are around 160 repositories worldwide that have it. Um, and indeed, there is no mention of FAIR in these requirements. But I'm not sure personally if we want that. I mean, lots of researchers, lots of data supporters, information professionals, data librarians, repositories have worked in a FAIR manner before this buzzword came about. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in time, in a couple of years, this notion of fair um, is no longer as hot as it is now. It's more important that we live up to uh, the ideas and the concepts behind it and beyond it. So speaking for repositories, we have always been in the area of making things findable. We didn't call it that, perhaps, <laughs> but of course the focus and the stress we place on good metadata, good descriptions, um, is uh, aligned with compatible with the notion of findability and so on. So there is no one-to-one -one translation, I agree, but I'm not, not sure if we should call everything fair, although I know this is a session about fair. And I don't think it's very likely to happen in the near future of the core trustee requirements because they are very new. Um, they were established last year, of course, building on other certification schemes. So I don't think um, the FAIR principles will be directly incorporated in the current requirements.
Thanks. Yes, I would yeah. agree with you, Gareth, that the alignment should be stressed. And well, actually, um, although Open Air is my sponsor for this Q and A session, um, this could, this should be part of what the Core Trustee Board is uh, disseminating and, and communicating as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you can wear several hats. I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you're more than welcome. Um, are there any other questions from uh, the, the participants? If not, I would like to ask you a question, Marianne, because I've been asked several times uh, something you might help in, in addressing. So uh, something like, what is the best license to apply to data to make them really fair? Um, if only one, or if there can be a combination of licenses? Ah, that's a nice one. Um, so, okay. I think this is a good moment to say that FAIR is important, but that the A in FAIR does not mean the data are open. Um, again, you all may be aware of this, but Sometimes it's confusing. Accessibility doesn't mean open to the world. Um, okay, having said that, the best license, I think, nowadays for um, declaring data open um, as far as it can be open would be a CC0 waiver. Uh, technically, it is not even a license, but okay. Um, so that gives you, gives everyone the best opportunity to reuse the data for any purpose whatsoever um, and even with this very open kind of license of course we are all still um, subject to good academic behavior that means we should still cite the, the researcher and the research that produced the data or the generated data so let there be no concern that CC0 means you can't be credited because that's just not true um, another thing that comes to mind is we talk about data. Um, I hope that the uh, the awareness will grow that data is very diverse and can also cover code, software. Lots of research projects do have software as a project deliverable. And that should be as open as possible as well, of course. And for software, you typically wouldn't use licenses from the Creative Commons family. But then you could think of uh, GNU licenses or EPL licenses. There are also different flavors in terms of more or less open. Having an explicit license for FAIR, which you asked, Ilaria, I'm not sure because I don't think there are licenses that say how interoperable, for instance, something is. No, um, not as far as I know. So basically, licenses can just cover a part of the of the fair requirements, but not all of them. No, they will typically uh, address the accessibility. So what you can do with the data. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if something can be um, fostered in this direction. Well, to make them more comprehensive and targeted to FAIR in general. Thanks a lot for, for your answer. So I will report back <laughs> to the people who asked me this. And, and also, yeah, so uh, another thanks from Joy. <laughs> about the work you're doing at DANS. You're welcome, thank you. Um, just out of the curiosity, how many trusted repositories do you have right now at DANS? Um, sorry, how many? Yeah, so, sorry, um, I'm reformulating the question. How many repositories are trusted according to the core trust seal? I think it's uh, about 160, so let me check if we can show you the the map on the screen. So. Um, this is 
an indication of what's there in the world. You see a strong dominance in uh, oops, Europe and uh, Northern America. Uh, screen's freezing. That shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, no worry. We can um, do it. You also see that um, if you can read it, let me make this a slightly yeah, bigger. It was, it was okay. Um, actually, so this is the website of Core Trust Seal, which is the current default scheme for getting uh, repository certified. Um, and there are some more advanced certification schemes as well, and they have smaller numbers. But even the Core Trust Seal, because it is so young, you can also see here a couple of repositories with the uh, data seal of approval and the World Data Systems certification. Um, Court data seal of approval and World Data System were uh, independent initiatives, and they joined forces also using uh, a dedicated working group of the Research Data Alliance. And together they came up with what is now called Core Trust Seal. So they picked the best uh, common requirements, updated them, made them uh, more up to date. And currently, when a repository uh, applies for certification, it can only apply for the core trust field and no longer for uh, WDS or DSA. Um, but usually, um, a certification holds for a couple of years, and this explains why it's the mixed view of these different flavors. Yeah, okay, thanks. That's very clear. And um, Referring to Garrett's observation about uh, the fact that it took a while preparing uh, all the the documents to to apply for the the, cost, the core trust seal, how long does it does it usually take for our repository to be assessed as certified? Oh, good question, Garrett. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, from your experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, perhaps that's, that's not the best motivation. Um, so, well, yeah, okay, uh, it's a lot of work, of work, but it's then rewarding but, because you are displayed on this nice map. <laughs> yeah. So, what I, I can say, um, I can give some indications. I think. Um, so, when a repository enters the assessment procedure for the first time, so perhaps a few words. Uh, uh, about the procedures. Core Trust Seal um, has a board and has a set of 16 requirements. You saw the majority of them, it's not much more, and of course there is some guidance on, the, uh, on these requirements. Um, the process is that the repository writes a self-assessment based on these guidelines, and part of um, the self-assessment is that the repository should provide written evidence to support their position on each of the 16 requirements. Now, this may be uh, a stage that takes a lot of time for a repository because even if a repository is very good, it doesn't mean they have all their processes um, in writing. So when the Dance Archive applied for certification for the first time, we had to, to write a lot of documents, um, not just for bureaucratic reasons, but it also helped us to consider our policies and to make them more specific and to connect also the high-level policy to the day-to-day -day workflow. And I think that's an instance of it's worth it, as Garrett writes. So it helped us to really think about our processes and to bring the people from the archive together with the people from the policy department and the technical department. And yes, that took a lot of time, but it was worth it. When we applied for a renewal of the seal a couple of years later, we did it, I think, in 15% of the time. So there are initial costs involved, um, you could say, and these are maybe high, um, but, they, but the next version, three to four years later, um, is much easier and much faster, typically. Okay, so uh, it's mainly because the effort needs to be an institutional effort in the beginning and then it's just like keeping all the processes updated and make sure they're really keeping on sticking with the principles. Yeah, but that, that's mainly it, because writing yourself assessments 
is not that hard, but you have to provide written evidence, and that may be hard. At the same time, um, I'm one of the reviewers for Court Vasil. Court Vasil have a lot of uh, reviewers. Each um, self-assessment is being reviewed by two people, of course not related to the archive that wants to get certification. Um, and we see very good examples of uh, repositories that have all these policy documents uh, openly accessible on their website. And that is very good because that also raises the awareness of reviewers um, uh, and then researchers mainly and of the people using the archive um, for reusing the data. So it is a, an ongoing process of communication, dissemination, awareness raising and so on. Um, and I think that's very valuable. And also, if all these policies are available to everyone because they are open, they could also work as a driver to other repositories to learn more about how their workflows could be improved to yeah, get the core seal. Yeah, definitely. You can learn through the, uh, the websites. You can also uh, find um, the underlying documentation at the Core Trust Seal website itself, so you can get inspired by many good examples. Yeah, that's very good to know because I mean, um, you you keep it for you take it for granted sometimes that I mean your institution is doing good and that all the processes are in place. But then, if you have to apply for a, a, a specific certification as the core trust seal is, then you you really have to reinvent all the all the workflows sometimes and all the processes. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for, for this answer. Um, is there any other question? Um, doesn't seem so. Um, <laughs> Can I then ask a question to you? <laughs> yeah, let's try it. Okay. Um, so it is uh, it's like one of the questions you started with, uh, Ilaria, from the, the Mentimeter. Um, but you've now all seen these ideas about measuring fairness. Um, and I mentioned what we think of it. What do you think? Who should measure the fairness of existing data sets? Let's make life easy and say one data users to the archive. And you can use the chat box again. That's an interesting question. So the first answer is the archive, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe the archive can work as a kind of a um, control body to ensure that everything is compliant and respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, the curators, yeah. After this session, you have some ideas about it, or maybe if you've played with the prototype, let us know because we don't know what the right way could be, or perhaps there is not a single correct way. Yeah, and I think that in this stage of prototyping, uh, all the all the feedback you can get could be very useful to fine tune uh, the prototype and to well to learn what are the expectations from from the users. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. And um, for users, it may feel like a, a huge burden. On the other hand, if we can make it as simple as, for instance, uh, uh, filling out a brief survey after you've used the hotel on booking.com or bought a book at Amazon, um, there is not that much burden. So we'll have to see if we can make it uh, as lightweight as that. <laughs> yeah. That would help, definitely. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, if there are not any other questions from, oh yeah, no, thanks Gareth, there's another observation. So I saw a recent tweet that the most important aspects of FAIR are the F and the R. If you can get there, your data can be considered almost there. So findable and reusable. Uh, I tend to agree. Um, I think we're doing all this for reusability. So uh, it's not because this is what Danscam arrived at as a conclusion for the with the prototype, but also because I think interoperability per se is not enough. Findability per se is not enough. Reusability per se is almost there. So yes, I think so too. And um, having the R and the the F and the R um, is also what is the current state of affairs. So in this original working group, the Lawrence working group that came up with the notion of the FAIR principles, it was a working group here in Leiden, um, there were uh, quite a number from the uh, participants from the life sciences. Now, I'm not a life scientist, but my understanding is that um, they have good protocols and practices when it comes to uh, interoperability, deciding on definitions, deciding on protocols, deciding on measurements and so on. So in that field or in those kinds of fields, interoperability may not sound too threatening. Uh, on the other hand, I know from social sciences and especially where people work in very small teams, sometimes one person teams, um, Findability is obvious, but accessibility and interoperability may sound somewhat scary, scaring. So, especially interoperability um, tends to get people anxious, we noticed. From that perspective alone, I would happily promote um, FAR principles rather than FAIR principles for the next, let's say, two years, and then move on to interoperability and so on. Of course, that is not black and white, and of course the world is changing and so on, but I think it is mistaken to assume that all domains um, can can make the data fair with the same, at the same pace. Yeah, I think that's reasonable uh, to think that communities at different levels of impurities in terms of interoperability and in general um, compliance to the fair principle. So, yeah, I mean, that would be ideal, but that would be probably too much <laughs> to, to deal with immediately. And part of the concern, I think, is raised by the European Commission um, because in their template for, uh, for, for data management, data management plans, they suggested interoperability would also work across disciplines. I like the ambition. I think it is quite far-fetched for many fields at the moment. Yeah, you, you called it in the right way. It is an ambition. Um, maybe something to tend to um, in the long term, but let's start small and then grow. <laughs> I would support that. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Other questions from the audience. Um, while you're thinking about something else to ask to Marian as she's here, I would like to remind you that um, this webinar has been recorded. Uh, the recordings are available on YouTube. Uh, and this Q&A session is being recorded right now and it will be available on the Open Air website very soon. Together with the links that Marian provided during the uh, during the presentation. There's another comment from Garrett. Uh, it's one of the reasons that the dance patch scheme is very interesting. When translating FAIR into repository requirements, having this to benchmark against is useful. Yes, I think so. 
Thanks, Garrett. Okay, if you don't have any other questions, um, I will close the webinar here. Uh, thanking Marian very, very much for um, your time and all the good work. And thank you everybody for joining and for being so active. Yeah, thank you very much everyone. Um, thanks for the question and the discussion and I hope it will be continued. Yeah, yeah. I keep a note for that. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.